All right, all ready to get going. Well, I am, uh, have the very great privilege of serving as the executive director of the Nobel Women's Initiative. And on behalf of all of us, we'd like to warmly welcome each and every one of you here to Belfast. We're delighted you're all here with us in this beautiful city, this beautiful venue, and indeed on this beautiful day. Over 100 of you have traveled from more than 20 countries to be here with us. You've traveled from far, dealt with visa challenges, frustrations, delayed flights. You've rearranged your personal schedules, your professional schedules to be here with us. And we're so appreciative that you're giving us your precious time. And we're very grateful for those you've left at home who are enabling you to do so. We know you all work every day very tirelessly for peace, with justice and equality, and we hope that you will not only come away from here with new friends and fresh ideas, but also refreshed, relaxed, and ready to continue your hard, important work every day, building a better world. Indeed, that is part of the founding vision of the Nobel laureates. When they formed the Nobel Women's Initiative in 2006, one of the first things they said they wanted to do together was to host gatherings of women activists to come together and share strategies, but also nourish one another. So we'll do everything we can to ensure you're comfortable and well cared for while you're here with us. We're truly thrilled to spend the next three days together with you, getting to know you better and learn more about your work the context of your work, your challenges and successes in, cha in challenging militarism in its many forms, halting violence against women in its many forms, and addressing environmental destruction and climate change, and what you're doing to build a world of human security for all and restoring our precious planet. For us at the Nobel Women's Initiative, this is quite a milestone as it's the first time that all six laureates of the Nobel Women's Initiative are here together. Like many of you in this room, the laureates are activists. They have a great many demands on their time, but it was very important to each and every one of them to be here with you, to get to know you, and to strategize together with you. We're profoundly grateful to have this opportunity together. We thank all of you, laureates, as well as each and every one of you in the room with us for making this happen. Since my arrival in Belfast a couple of days ago, the British news has been full of a story of a British soldier murdered in London. Some of you may have read about it or seen about it. Ingrid Louis Kennett was taking the bus to visit her children, and when her bus stopped with the commotion, she looked outside and saw a body in the street and two men holding a bloody knife and an ax that were nearby. While others were picking up their cell phones and taking photos, she calmly got off the bus and went to speak to the two men. As she approached the body, one of the men said, don't get too close to that body. And she later described it. I thought, what the heck? Obviously, he was a bit excited. But the thing was, I just wanted to talk to him. I wasn't scared, he wasn't drunk, he wasn't on drugs. He was normal. I could speak to him and he wanted to speak. So that's what we did. I went to speak to the other man who was quieter and I asked him if he wanted to give me what he was holding, which was a knife, but I didn't want to say that. He didn't agree and I asked, do you want to carry on? And he said, no, no. By treating him as a human being, by speaking to him and listening to him, she diffused terrifying situation and ensured that no others were hurt. She demonstrated the power of individual nonviolent action. Imagine if more of us had more opportunities for trainings and programs in nonviolence and peace education, how many more of us would be comfortable doing what she did. And then also, of course, working together in collective nonviolent action what Maraid and the peace people did, what Tawakal and her Yemeni colleagues did, what Jodi and disarmament activists did, what Shirin and women in Iran do, what Lema and the Liberian peace-building women do, what Rigoberta and the indigenous Guatemalan women do every day, what all of you do every day. Just as Rosa Parks wasn't accidentally tired one day, but trained for a life of nonviolent activism, strategized with her movement allies, 
we know the importance and hard work of training for change. And here at Women Beyond War, we aim to share some of those practical tactics and strategies and skills that each of you are using in building a nonviolent world. The host for this conference, as you know, is Mairead McGuire. I'd like to thank you and express our behalf of all of us our thanks for Mairead has uh, in, been involved very directly in helping us plan this event. And of course, I also want to thank her colleagues Anne, Claire, and Jerry, and the many colleagues at Peace People who have helped us in co-hosting this. And you're going to learn more. You saw a bit in the film and learned a bit to some of you with us last night, but you'll be learning more this afternoon about their work in nonviolence here in Ireland. Well, my dear friends, it is a great joy for me to be here this morning and to look out on the sea of great friends <laughs> with whom I've shared prison cells <laughs> and new friends. And Thomas Merton once wrote, when you work for peace, you realize that it's not about the projects, though they are important. It's about the relationships. It's about the quality of relationships that you make during this journey. And Alice Walker, the great American poetess, wrote a lovely thing, a piece of advice to us all in these turbulent times. She said that when there's much confusion and much fear, you deepen the roots of your friendships with your family, with your friends, in your circle. And we all each have a circle. And then that circle widens, and those circles connect. And that's a powerful thought, because what Alice is telling us to do, and Thomas Merton is telling us to do, is to get our priorities right, not to get lost in the urgency of changing the world. So as women activists, I think that's, and men, I believe that a good team is two men or two women and a man and a woman working together in teamship. It's very important. That's where you find your strength. So I think that as women and men working together, what do we bring to a highly militarized world on a downward slope of perpetual war? Because that is the agenda of the superpowers. We are on a track of proxy war, as in Syria, and war, as has happened in the last years. That's the track we are on. And we must not underestimate the enormity of what we are challenging when we say human life is sacred. We want dignity for every man, woman, and child. We are inspired by the Arab Spring. The message of the Arab Spring was all about dignity. 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 And how do we give dignity? Starting with ourselves. And I think it's important to challenge those who are working for social and political justice, who are hurting inside in many countries, particularly our Muslim brothers and sisters have had such a bad deal and continue to get a bad deal. How do we encourage them when that lack of dignity get so deep that they believe taking a gun or being a suicide bomber is somehow the way to answer it. We have a great poet who wrote, too long a sacrifice makes a stone of the heart. We witness every day now with the increase of militancy around our world. It's the pain of the unheard voice but what we say to people who believe that violence works is work for justice. 
have a passion for justice. Tire yourself out in working for justice because we need that in an equal world. But respect your own life and do not take your own life and do not take the life of another one in that process. That's our appeal to young people who are hurting. Put up the gun and come on board to help all of us who want to see a fairer and a just world. The means must justify the ends. Gandhi said, you can't get a good end if you're using the wrong means. And that's the message we must send out to those who believe in the armed struggles. Armed struggles, if they kill people, do not bring about just and peaceful societies. We learned that here in Northern Ireland. And our message to those who would use militarism and war and cruelty and destruction and who would target countries to take down their leadership and then when the country comes apart at the seams, move in to rebuild it again. How crazy a thinking is that? That's not a woman's thinking. No woman thinks you destroy a country and then send in contractors to rebuild it again. That's crazy. Women have a vision. Women have a clarity of thought. We have fine minds, but more often what is needed is compassion, fine hearts, forgiveness, reconciliation. If women have anything to bring to the table, it is to reestablish the values in our world today the values of respect for each other, the values of compassion and forgiveness and mercy and reconciliation, the moral values, the ethical values that our world has somehow begun, begun to lose. This is, I think, the task we need. Some people may say those are spiritual values. They are the world can only change if we reinstate spiritual and political values. This is a spiritual movement. When a world goes to war, it is a question of is it moral? Is it ethical? Is it moral to move into these countries, steal their resources, steal their oil, and then talk about international law and human rights? No. It's a nonsense. So we challenge our political leaders to uphold and give leadership in the world today to the true values of humanity, to the true dignity of every man, woman, and child, and to end wars, to end this madness of war and terror, which is actually a war on the poor. We demand of our political leaders and we must do that wherever we live. In the, Irish, in the Irish Times this morning, a little article where I say to the Irish government, because you start where you are. Everybody else does what they can where they are. You start where you are. And I have challenged the Irish government to maintain its neutrality, to stop allowing American soldiers going through Shannon Airport in their thousands to go off to kill the children of Iraq. You start where you are to challenge your government and you enable people in other countries, wherever they are, to stand up to challenge their government and to know they are not alone, particularly the people in prisons we say to those who come out non-violently for change, you are not alone. So thank you very much, and I'm so happy to have you here to support us and us to support you. We are on a great journey together to bring change to our world. Thank you. gran honor estar aquí con 
muchas maestras, eh, muchas mujeres que han recibido primero el premio Nobel, pero también que han emprendido las luchas primero que, que yo. Entonces yo quiero pedirle a mis compatriotas guatemaltecas, Helen, Rosalina, Lola, para que se paren, porque gracias a ellas también estamos, eh, eh, hemos tenido muchos éxitos, muchos éxitos en la lucha por los derechos humanos. Y luego pues decir que es un honor estar aquí al lado de Judith como siempre y al lado de Meirit y conocer a las dos hermanas que pues acaban de recibir el premio Nobel de la Paz que sabemos que tienen un larguísimo camino por delante y eh, casi que las que las viejas que estamos aquí, las viejas premios Nobel, que ya pasamos más de 20 años, eh, podemos decirles que la tarima de un premio Nobel es muy importante, es muy importante si uno lo puede usar como facilitar procesos, solo facilitar, no pretender resolver porque ni un premio Nobel, ni una persona puede resolver los problemas que tiene nuestra sociedad, los problemas que tiene nuestro mundo, los problemas integrales que viven los pueblos hoy por hoy, sino solamente es la fuerza de todos, es la fuerza de muchas personas, es la lucha de muchas mujeres, es la lucha de muchas organizaciones, sobre todo las personas organizadas, porque hay muchas personas que luchan en la soledad, pero lo más importante es cuando sabemos articular nuestras potencialidades para poder dar un mensaje significativo en contra de la impunidad porque hay mucha impunidad en todo el mundo. No se utilizan las normas que se han elaborado y no se utilizan las instituciones para defender la dignidad de los pueblos. Entonces, lo más importante es tener una agenda y para tener una agenda se necesita tener colaboradores, voluntariados, Personas que dan sus talentos profesionales, sus talentos humanos al servicio de una causa colectiva, al servicio de una causa común. Entonces ninguna de nosotras podría triunfar si no es la lucha de mucha gente. Y por eso creo que todos los logros que yo vengo a compartir con ustedes no son logros personales, sino son logros que gracias a mucha gente que hemos podido hacer lo que hemos logrado hacer en Guatemala. Primero, nuestra meta más grande es perseguir los crímenes contra la humanidad, los delitos que se cometen en un país pero que ofende la conciencia humana. Por eso es que nuestra la agenda personal que yo he llevado es la lucha en contra del genocidio, la lucha en contra del etnocidio, la lucha en contra de la tortura, la desaparición forzada, la lucha en contra del terrorismo de Estado porque hay estados que cometen terrorismo y que pensamos que el terrorismo solo es de grupos fuera del estado. Y la experiencia nuestra es que el estado comete terrorismo. 
pero también nos da mucha satisfacción que en los últimos años hemos ingresado en la definición de los delitos de lesa humanidad, también el feminicidio, la brutalidad en contra de la mujer, porque en muchas partes se ha cometido violencia extraordinariamente ilustrativo para denigrar absolutamente a la mujer. Entonces, por supuesto que en nuestros países, en muchos países, se comete el feminicidio, pero no estaba calificado como delito de lesa humanidad. Hoy tenemos unos avances. ¿Y cómo hemos hecho esos avances? En primer lugar, hay dos caminos para sancionar los crímenes contra la humanidad. Uno es que sea desde las más altas esferas de las Naciones Unidas, de los tribunales penales internacionales, etc. Y en esos caminos probablemente nos vamos a perder porque los países tienen tanta influencia en todas esas esferas que no permiten de verdad no solo la tipificación de esos delitos, sino la sanción a esos delitos. Por lo tanto, hemos tenido que acudir a nuestros instrumentos nacionales. Hemos tenido que desafiar nuestras normas nacionales. Por eso, en estos 20 años, hemos acudido a varios tribunales, pero uno de ellos son los propios tribunales guatemaltecos. Y así es como ustedes han visto en estos últimos 15 días, que es la primera vez en la historia de la humanidad que en Guatemala se integró un tribunal de alto impacto y ese tribunal de alto impacto llevó adelante un proceso de juzgamiento de genocidio en nuestro propio país. Muchos podrán decir que quiere decir que es un producto de la paz firme y duradera. Por un lado, sí, gracias a los avances que dimos en el proceso de paz firme y duradera que se firmó hace casi 20 años. Pero por otro lado, no es gracias a la paz que hay una tipificación del genocidio sino gracias a las mujeres. Las mujeres guardaron las evidencias más importantes de los delitos. Por ejemplo, nunca perdieron de vista dónde quedó una fosa común y cuánta gente estaba en esa fosa común y dónde y podré posiblemente qué característica tenían las víctimas que fueron, se quedaron en una fosa común. Y ellos sabían que era su esposo, era su hijo, era su nieto o era un pariente que conocían. Al llevar adelante toda la investigación, acudimos a las exhumaciones, por ejemplo. Como Rosalina, que estuvo casi tres tres meses o cuatro meses junto con su madre, sus hermanos y la comunidad cuidando la fosa común para que no vengan a saquear la información y llegar hasta el final de una exhumación. Eso quiere mucho coraje y eso quiere también mucha convicción del que no solo buscar un entierro digno a un ser querido, sino al mismo tiempo buscar dos cosas que nosotros hemos querido encontrar. Uno es la verdad. Queremos acreditar nuestra verdad, porque siempre dicen esas víctimas exageran, 
Esas víctimas son mentirosas. A mí me han acusado de mentirosas, mentirosas durante 33 años. Entonces, esa acreditación de la verdad de las víctimas es muy importante. Segundo, esa justicia justa. Entonces, yo creo que lo más importante es dónde vamos a sentar un precedente. Y para sentar un precedente se necesita de la fuerza de muchos. Así que yo creo que todos ustedes son mujeres luchadoras y saben muy bien que la lucha por una causa no es de un día, es de todos los días. Y así que ojalá que la iniciativa siga siendo lo que ha sido desde que se creó. Dar oportunidad que muchas mujeres no solo hablaran, sino descansaran. Eh, descansaran, porque aquí conocemos los problemas. Queremos, ustedes son solidarias. No, no solo venir a un evento, sino sean solidarias. Tengan en su agenda lo que hacen otras. Eh, sientan su triunfo como el de otras y hagan posible que los premios Nobel tengan eh, fuerza y a la vez apoyen concretamente a la gente, no discursos. Nosotros ya no vamos a la ONU porque no nos gustan los discursos. Ya no vamos a ningún otro evento regional porque los discursos son muy buenos, pero ofende lo que pasa todos los días en la vida de las personas. Muchas gracias. I want to start by saying thank you to the NWI delegation that came to Liberia earlier this year. Um, you came at a time when I was going through hell. And there was a lot of misunderstanding about my very controversial role now in that country. Your presence there helped to at least make people understand why I fight, why the women of Liberia fight. And it was a very comforting time for me because your visit also vindicated some of the things that I said. It, it, it was a good visit. And I'm proud to and happy to report that some of the things that you all saw and thought to work for or work on has materialized. You went to Totota. You met with Ma Ani and her team, and Ma Ani is sitting there. Ma Ani, can you just stand? Ma Ani is a champion for peace, and one of the requests the women made was for microfinance loan or some kind of assistance. To date, they've gotten 40 women loans to do, or 40 women assistance grants to do their different businesses, and 40 more to receive in the coming weeks. The Rock Hill women, we started working on the water project. The leader of Rock Hill, Vaba, is here. And we were able to draw attention to the situation of those people living in Monrovia but cannot access water in the heart of the city. The head of the board of the water company paid a visit to their community and cried. Even as a Liberian man, he cried because the one remaining hand pump that they depended on when we were there had broken down. So they virtually fetched water from a very muddy stream and because their children have to go very early, rape and teenage pregnancy is a problem in their community. They promised to bring water up and prior to their coming, we had been working on trying to get some hand pumps to them. The water company has been rocked by corruption over the last few days, and I don't think they're going to get 
the water immediately because we're hearing something about $250,000. So we've gone back to our plan A, providing them hand pump. My foundation is going to do two, which is costing um, $240 a pump. So we're going to do two for that very large community whilst we look around for funding. So again, thank you all for really just going into that community. The women have a Liberian way of saying the Nobel women made us big. So now the men know they can't mess with us because we know big people. <laughs> Bernie's is also here from the Women Peace Building Network, a group I coordinated and led the Mass Action for Peace. Bernie's is a activist on rape and sexual violence in Liberia, treading grounds that no one dared to tread, and you don't want to get in trouble with her because her mouth has no limit. So Bernice is sitting right there. But I just want to say thank you <laughs> to the Nobel women and to all of the activists in this room that keep the fight on, as Rogaberto said and as Marie said. I tell people it's not a day's job. It is your life. It is what determines that some of our children will see their 20th birthday. It is our insurance policy when we get into the life of activism. We have come to this place to talk about beyond militarism and war. And I tried to be the Nobel laureate by going to research and trying to write a paper. And every article I read on the internet and every research I did, I just threw my hands up and said, I'm tired. I'm tired because there are numerous articles and research that has been done on this topic and quoting each other is, is, is there in the hundreds of thousands, and those of you who come from university settings would definitely know. But I also remember that you can't get tired doing this work, but I just get tired because all of the things that we have rating, it is there, but the problem persists. Extremist ideologies have grown so large in our world today and we see now the viciousness and the boldness with which militarism and all of its features are taking over our communities. Liz spoke about the attacks in London. When I saw it, I was shocked. And for someone who lived in 14 years of war, you shouldn't be shocked at violence, but I was shocked at the boldness with which these young men took to the streets of London and killed someone. A few months ago, as part of being a Nobel laureate, I always say, let me interact with children because I think it's necessary. So I found myself in New Orleans, and I asked to go to the Ninth Ward, and they gave me a group of fantastic children who they told everything about who a Nobel laureate is, but nothing about who being an African is. So that's another story for another day. <laughs> but one of the little boys raised his hand and said, Miss Lima, I want to be a Nobel laureate when I grow up. I said, that's great. He said, but I, I don't know how to do that. And in his eight-year-old words, every time I put on the TV, I see violence and violence and war and murders and murders. I'm sick and tired of murders. And I said, child, you, 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 you have just expressed my sentiments. But the question that comes to mind, even as I prepared for this talk, I was thinking, what do we do? How do we negotiate this world so that this eight-year-old who wants to be a Nobel laureate can get to the place where he learned peace, where he sees peace on TV, instead of seeing violence and murder, and it becomes his everyday life? And it takes me back to the early 70s, and just telling you my age, I'm 41. And so the early 70s, I was a little girl. And going to the Lutheran church, and one of the things they fed us with was the whole anti-apartheid campaign. At that very young age, that's when I learned about Mandela and his struggle for any apartheid in South Africa. And you would not go to church on that Sunday or any Sunday where you did not have to place a coin in the offering basket for to end apartheid. And as I thought about any militarism and violence, I think it's time for us to really strategically invade spaces that we've stopped invading. It's time for us to move out it's good for us to come together and strategize, but I think it's time for us to impose ourselves strategically on different spaces. So what is my crazy idea? My crazy idea is that we engage religious institutions as they fed, they fed me to oppose apartheid in every way. 
And I think it helped to shape me to be the radical for peace that I am today. And I think it's time for us to move back. There are 2.1 billion Christians globally. 1.2 billion Muslims globally. How are we engaging these religious institutions? They have so much power, they wield so much power in our world today. How do we embrace or engage their space to help us fight the fight that we are fighting? My biggest criticism of most of the Christian churches in Liberia is that we never hear our pastors preach about rape and sexual violence. And is it because they don't want to do so? I read that they don't do it because they don't understand. So I'm proposing that we invade their spaces and educate them. Give them, the, give them some, or some of the reasons. It's not good enough for us to say rape in Diara Congo is a genocide. We need to back it up with the statistics so that our religious leaders start to understand that this is really a serious problem. We need to also invade the spaces of our children who are going to inherit the world. In, on Sunday, my latest baby will turn four. And I think I'm breathing or I'm bringing up a feminist. But when she comes from school and says, Mommy, today we talked about what mommies and daddies do. And then I ask her, Moksa, what does mommies do? She said, Mommies cook, they stay home. And then what does daddies do? Daddies drive, they go to work. And I say, Hello, Mok, I work. I drive. She said, I know, mommy, but I did not tell my teacher that. <laughs> but if our children at those early ages are being taught patriarchy in a very mild form, are being taught militarism, whether we like it or not, in a very mild form, how do we step into their world? How do we step into the religious world and work? on moving beyond militarism and war to a world of peace and nonviolence. Thank you. به مناسبت اینکه ما رو اینجا دعوت کردن و برای تشکیل این سمینار زحمت کشیدن سپاس گذاری کنم همینطور میدانم که کارمندان NWI و و خصوصا ریز چقدر زحمت کشیدن برای اینکه تمه مسائل رو تنظیم بکنن من سپاسگزار همه افراد هستم که باعث شدن ما امروز اینجا دور هم جمع شیم و زمین میخواستم از همکاران ایرانی خودم که در اینجا حضور دارن سپاسگزاری کنم شش نفر زن ایرانی الان بین شما نشستند همه اینها همان گونه می اندیشند که شما و خواست همه این آنها همان خواست شماست حقوق برابر برای زنان اما تفاوت آنها با شما این است که همه این افراد به زندان رفتند برای اینکه یک خواست انسانی داشتن میخواستن حقوق برابر مانند یک انسان برای اونها شناخته بشه بعضی از اونها الان که اینجا هستن شش سال زمانی که جوانتر بودن در زندان سفری کردن به خاطر دموکراسی من خواهش میکنم همکاران من که به خاطر آرمان هاشون زندان رفتن و الان اینجا حضور دارن بلن بشن و شما اونها رو تشویق کنید برای ادامه راهشون ما در 
چنین کشوری زندگی میکنیم و ایران چنین حکومتی دارد وقتی زنی اعتراض میکند به نابرابری قانونی و میگوید من هم انسانم و مثل یک مرد حقوق دارم او را به زندان میاندازم که نمونش این افراد هستند اما فقط اینها نیستند متاسفانه الان تعدادی از همکاران ما در زندان هستند از جمله یکی از آنها رو که در کنفرانس دابلین شما اگر به خاطر داشته باشید باردار بود یه دختر جوانی که وکیل و همکار من خانم نسرین سدوده شش سال حبس مخموم شد و الان بیش از سه ساله که در زندان فقط برای اینکه اعتراض می کند به حقوق نابرابر خشونت دوستان عزیز خشونت مصریه مثل یک ویروسه با خشونت بایستی در هر جا مبارزه کرد حتی یک خشونت کم هم می تواند خطرناک باشد برای اینکه مصریه و خشونت های بیشتری رو به دنبال خواهد داشت و همین دلیل از خشونت خانگی صحبت می کنم بچه ای که می بیند پدرش خشونت می کنه بچه ای که در خیابان شاهد خشونت های خیابانی است این نمی تواند آدمی غیر خشن باشد با خشونت بایستی مبارزه کرد و صحبت از خشونت خیابانی شد یکی از مسائل دردناک کشور من آن است که برخی از افراد در خیابان و جلوی چشم مردم دار میزنند و این رو برمان تنبیه به کار میبرند مجرمی که باعث عبرت دیگران بشود و نمی و حکومت متوجه نیست که چگونه ویروس خشونت رو در جامعه می پراکند. اینجا آمده این تا همگی با نظامیگری مخالفت کنیم زیرا هزینه بالای نظامی مهمترین عامل در ایجاد فقر و گرسنگی است کشورهایی هستند که حتی تعداد سربازانشون از تعداد معلمینشون بیشتره و متاسفانه ببینیم در قالب کشورها هزینه بالای نظامی باعث شده که مردم فقیر بشوند و حالا که منابع ملی بایستی صرف رفاه مردم بشن بیش از یک میلیارد و سی 
سی میلیون مردم جهان گرسنه هستند یعنی در آرزوی یک تکنانی هستند که در ما در اروپا یا در آمریکا به دور میاندازیم این گرسنگی از کجا میاد و چگونه میشود با آن مبارزه کرد یکی از راه ها این است که هزینه نظامی بایستی کاسته شود ما از کشورهای مختلف آمده ایم و خواهش من از شما شرکت کنندگان این است که فقط به شنیدن حرفهای همدیگر قناعت نکنیم تعهد کنیم به خودمان که وقتی رفتیم به کشورمون به حکومت بگوییم حداقل ده درصد از هزینه نظامی رو بایستی بکاهد و فشار بیاریم روی حکومت بود برای اینکه هزینه نظامی رو کاهش پیدا بکنه یکی از کشورهایی که هزینه نظامی خیلی بالا داره کشور من ایرانه کشور من موشک های قوی می تواند بسازد تکنولوژی نظامی بسیار بالایی دارد اما هر سال بیش از یک میلیون کودک که باید مدرسه رو شروع کند نمیتواند به لب فقر به مدرسه برود یک مدرسه به میزان کافی نداریم اما دولت ایران هزینه هنگفتی می کند که اسلحه به بشارست بدهد که مردم رو بکشه دولت ایران با برنامه های غلط انرژی هستهی باعث شده که ایران تحریم اقتصادی شدیدی بشود و مردم ایران معتقدند که دولت بایستی قلیسازی اورانیوم را متوقف بکنه تا این فقری که در ایران ایجاد شده و روز به روز گسترش میابد خاتمه پیدا بکنه سال گذشته دو کشتی اسلحه در سواحل آفریقا کش شد و معلوم شد که دولت ایران اینها رو برای سرگال میفرسته که مردم علیه حکومتشون مبارزه کنن و این باعث شد که رابطه سیاسی سنگال با دولت ایران قطع بشه دولت ایران به بسیاری از کشورها از جمله لبنان و سوریه اسلحه میدهد و سؤال مردم ایران این است که چرا پول ملی که باید صرف ساختن مدرسه بشود که باید صرف ساختن بیمارستان بشود با اون پول اسلحه میخرید و به دیکتاتورها کمک میکنید و کمک میکنید که مردم بیگنا کشته بشوند سربازان ما جوانان ما الان در سوریه دارن کشته میشن چرا؟ برای اینکه دولت ایران نیروی نظامی به سوریه فرستاده که به بشار اسد کمک کنه که مردم رو بکشن و 
پس سوال من این است سربازان ما باید به ایران برگردند تا بتوانند ایران را بسازند وظیفه اونها کشتن مردم بیگناهی است با سیاست خارجی دولت ایران که بر مبنای نظامیگری است ما زنان و همچنین مردان ایرانی مخالفی برای این که می داریم فقط با صلح هست و با دوستی که می توانیم در کنار هم به سر بریم و خیلی کوتاه در خاتمه سخنرانانم سخنرانی هم می خواهم اشاره کنم خطای مردم مربوط هست به خودشون نه به مذهب و تمدنی که تعلق دارد بسیار متاسفم از فاجعه که در لندن اتفاق افتاد اما آن جنایتکار و عمل جنایی او هیچ ارتباطی با اسلام ندارد اسلام ترور رو و مخالف ترور و خشونت چرا گناه ادهی جنایتکار رو پای دین اسلام نوشته می شود همانطوری که اتفاقاتی که در بوزنی افتاد ما پای مسیحی ها نمی نویسیم برای اینکه خطای افراده یا به خاطرتون میاد سربازان آمریکایی که به عراق رفتن چطور با مردم عراق رفتار کردن این خطای یک شخص هیچ ارتباطی به فرهنگ آمریکایی یا مذهب مسیحی ندارد یا اتفاقاتی که در غزه میفته ارتباطی به دین یهود ندارد همه ادیان مخالف خشونت هستند پس خواهش میکنم خطای مردم رو منتصب به مذهبشون نکنید و اگر کسی در جایی جنایت کرد نگویی همه پیروان آن مذهب خشن و جنایت کار هستند ما همگی معتقد به انسانیت هستیم و این چیزی است که همه مذاهب میگویند با آرزوی دوستی و سرد بیشتر بین همه مردم جهان متشکرم Ladies and gentlemen There is no gentleman here Yeah, there is, there are a lot <laughs> Thank you for attending our important co uh, conference Thanks for Maureen Thanks for Judy Thanks for my sisters in Nobel Peace uh, Prize Initiative. Thanks for all women in, that win a one uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Thanks for you, you as women acti activists, as human activists. Uh, we did a lot for making peace, for protecting human rights for fighting corruption, for making this world better for us, for our children, for all the people who, are, who live in this world and the world needs from us more and more. Dear everyone, the programs and activities and the plans of building peace 
needs to be and needs to achieve many goals and to target the field of human life in this world. It, may, it needs to, to target the whole field in culture, social, politic, and economy. Peace as a tool, peace as a practice, came as a result of the culture of violence and the culture of conflict. Sorry, peace as a tool, peace as practice, came as a culture who hate violence and who fight conflict. Peace based on thought which argue people to have existence and acceptance and dialogue. While the conflict and violence came from a culture that like violence and that rise the, the value of war and killing. So we need all the effort and practices and programs of peace building must, must go to spread the culture of heating and fighting the conflict and build on another culture that supporting the peace and refuse the conflict and violence. Dears, the most important reason which feed the conflicts and violence in a lot of societies and countries around the world is that traditional and, best, and the, it is that bad traditional and customs that depends on revenge, that depends on that the strong one who is the remains. The remains is for, for just the strong one. All the, the reasons or the most important reason that spread and fire the conflict is, as I told you, is the customs and tradition that depends on, re uh, on, on revenge and also who make that this one who is stronger and who is good man, and we say it in Yemen, Ahmar Ain, he is red uh, eyes, he's a good who can carry weapons and who can shoot and who can protect criminals and killers from justice. So, because of this culture, because of this custom, because of this bad traditional, the circle of revenge is continue and continue and continue. And there is no way to stop it. There is no way to build peace without changing that bad customs and traditional. There is no peace building without working together on building a new customs and traditional that, that work on justice, work on uh, guarantee justice and work on guarantee a good social relationship that, that uh, based on respect each other, accept each other, and also love each other. Also, to encourage people to go forward for building, not destroying. We need also, when we are working on the peace building, we need to make a lot of effort 
on the side of building constitutions and laws that is empowering, that is empowering means taqwiya, صح? Taqwiya, empowering. That is empowering the rule of law. That is empowering human, uh, uh, that is empowering respect to human rights and also respect and empowering the justice uh, system. Which in most of the countries who are uh, suffer, uh, who are in um, to anim in halat al fashal suffer from uh, being failure. It's, you know, it's absence. There is no justice system, and there is no human rights uh, 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 respect. Respect. We need also in all these countries when we are want to to make peace building. We need also to make laws special on that countries who are, who has uh, a transitional period. We need to build the new laws that guarantee transitional justice at that time. Dear everyone, we need also to know that peace building must not come after conflict. We should make all the procedure before the conflict happen. Uh, predict. We have to predict if this conflict will be, will be there, there at, that, at this country or that country. Not after we see thousands of people who are dying in the street. Peace building must be sustainable and guarantee to not be again. Uh, not to go back to the struggle. Not to go back to the conflict. When we want to, be, to make peace building in, in any countries, we have to do. We have to conduct before the conflict. And inside the conflict, after the inside, when we 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 spread peace in this in this country, we have to make laws, we have to make constitutions that that guarantee that. And also after the conflict, we have to do something that is guaranteed that this conflict will not be again, which is regarding to the economic development. Economic development is very very important in the peace building process. With poverty, the conflict will come. Uh, peace uh, process. No, okay, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> so yes, with poverty, the conflict will come. There is no peace without development. And there is no development if there is no peace. The conflicts and violence came when the rule of law is absent. When the country of institutions is absent. When the revenge between people and, 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 and societies is rising. When the human rights is absent, when the corruption is there, when the equal citizenship also is absent. So when we work on peace building, we need to guarantee all that. We need to think about all that. We need to work for human rights, for fighting corruption, for building a good institutions, for building a good justice system, and also for good, good governance uh, as general. She told me that I have just one minute. <laughs> yeah. I will thank you now, and let's be 
one hand. This is the only way to spirit peace around all over the world. We need peace as something we smile, we, sm we, sm we, smell, we, smell, we smell. It's our new identity, identity as human. Is our common is peace. Peace must be there without talking about the background of all the humans around this world, about their religion, their colors, if they are uh, women or men, about we have to we have to look at the peace as something is gathering us. It's our message and it's our goal and. In this small world, if you work with that, if, we, if there is any conflict in any small village, any small point in this small, in this small world, I think the fault will be with us. We should see to all the people is our people. We should to see to all the countries is our countries. Let's live, uh, live, in, uh, live in this world with peace, with love, with work with each other, with coordination. Thank you so much. Um, I just would like us to take one second to remember um, our sister laureate, Wangari Matai, who we lost um, since the last conference that we had, and we miss her greatly. She was a big heart and a big spirit. So. She's still with us, I know, but we miss her. Although we have you, darling. <laughs> I, I just, I'll be quick, because I've been told I have to be quick. I ponder a lot elements of tackling militarism, and th these are not new ideas. Um, I don't think there's anything, any such new idea in the world. Everybody recreates what's come before, in my view, but I think we need to tackle violence and war and the glorification thereof. We need to tackle the belief that violence is inevitable, that it just bubbles up and bursts out and there's nothing we can do about it. We need to tackle the denigration of people who work for peace. And I also think we ought to tackle Article 26 of the UN Charter. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about those elements. And particularly in my own country, the United States of America, which of course is the most aggressive country in the world, unfortunately. And if there's one book I want to recommend to you, please go get Jeremy Scahill's S-C-A-H-I-L-L, -L, Dirty Wars. It's 900 some odd pages long. But it almost reads like a novel, and he talks about the U.S. war on terror and the perpetual war carried out by the U.S. In the U.S. and, I, and, and everywhere else, I'm sure, we totally glorify violence and war. I, I think about the marriage of Hollywood and the Pentagon, and it makes me really unwell. I wonder how much of my tax dollars go to the military involvement in Hollywood movies of late. There have been movies, I can't think of the names of them, but recently there have been movies in which active duty military have participated. What the hell is US active duty military doing in a Hollywood film? Pentagon offers machinery of war to make films more realistic, and yet we sit back and we do not challenge that. We need to go and talk to the producers and the owners of studios in Hollywood and say, enough already. It's sort of like what you were talking about, about the subtleties of, you know, what does mommy do? She cooks. What does daddy do? He does the, you know, important things, you know, teaching sexism. Well, in my country, we teach war. History is a glorification of war. We need to peel away, like onion, the layers of the glorification of war. We need to really focus on who 
propose, or who makes people go to war? It isn't the soldiers themselves. I would warrant that very few human beings on their own would say, oh, yay, I want to go and get shot at. Yay, I want to go massacre people. It's, in my country, fat, old, white men sending other people's children to die. And we need to stop focusing on the people who are going, well, I don't mean it that way. We need to focus on the fat, white men sending other people's children to die. We need to tackle that. We need to tackle the belief that human beings just can't control ourselves and violence just bubbles up. That is patently absurd. Violence is a choice. When a man chooses to beat his girlfriend or his children, or a girl occasionally beating her boyfriend, not as often, it is a choice of violence over discussion. And the more you nurture those choices, the more they are going to occur. If we give the message through films, through action, that violence is you know, inevitable, then people will resort to violence because it's inevitable. And oh my God, I couldn't help myself. You know, Emotion and everything overcame me. If we want to cultivate a culture of nonviolence and conflict resolution, that's what we have to cultivate. If we keep nurturing violence and the glorification of war, of course we're going to have more of that. We have to make people understand that while individuals may be heroic in war, war is not heroic. War is blood and guts and diarrhea and disembowelment, body parts strewn across the battlefield, War is damn ugly, and we have to stop allowing governments and militaries to pretend that war itself is somehow heroic and glorious. It is not. We have to help people understand that the root of every war is about power and money and resources. It is not, as you pointed out, about religion, it is not about Islam, it is not about Catholicism or Christianity or Buddhism. It's about the small cabal in power wanting to either keep that power or expand that power or steal somebody else's stuff. That is the root of war and we need to address that. And we need to reclaim peace. Some of you have heard me rant on this before. I really do rant on it. Um, peace is not kumbaya, peace is not the dove, peace is not the rainbow, peace is not shitty poetry that people keep sending me, bad peace poetry, please do not send me bad peace poetry <laughs> that I have to pretend I like, but I don't, I actually throw it away, so save your paper. <laughs> peace is hard work every single day. We are called peaceniks or granolas or tree-hugging liberals. Trust me, I am not a liberal. I go way with my sisters to radicalism. I am no liberal. I, can't, I find it an insult. But we're called all sorts of names to cut off conversation that sustainable peace is a possibility and it takes work to make it a reality. Every time somebody talks about wimpy people who want to, you know, work for peace, I think, oh, yeah, right. Martin Luther King, I think he was rather wimpy. You know, he stood up for his rights. He stood up for the rights of his people, and he went to prison. And the thousands and millions with him who suffered for struggling for racial equality. Nelson Mandela, hardly a wimp. Aung San Suu Kyi, working for sustainable peace is hard work. And we need to disabuse people of the notion that peaceniks are somehow, you know, dancing around the Maypole and having fun singing Kumbaya. It is not building peace. Um, I had one other point, but I ain't remembering it now. Oh, I know, Article 26. 
I'm going to end with this. Um, I'm not a great fan of the UN. Uh, and some of you have heard me ranting about that as well. I won't go off on it, because I could spend a hell of a lot of time on it. But it has its uses. Um, the UN Charter, Article 26, called for the Security Council to actually develop a plan to divert resources from war to meet the needs of people, from national security to human security. Of course, they never did it. Of course, they have no intention of so doing. I still think it could be a fun exercise for civil society to do it for them. And then we can use it and put it in their face. I kind of like the idea. I like bringing together a panel of you know, activists to tackle Article 26 and just put it right in their face. And in my country, obviously, we have a lot to tackle, because those of you who were there last night heard me mention the stats I just saw. The United States spent, I don't know if it was 2010 or 2011, $711 billion on our military and war. The rest of the world combined, combined, everybody else, $689 million or $600 billion or 698 I might have transposed but we spend more than the rest of the world combined. So it is incumbent upon people in the US to really get out there and peacefully kick some butt for peace. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.